Last week we did Jonah 3, and uh, we talked about uh, how God finally was able to get Jonah to do what he was supposed to do. Jonah uh, went, shared the message that God told him, and many came to God through that. Yet we're going to see this morning that Jonah was not happy about these people coming to Christ. I pray that is never our attitude about people coming to Christ, but it's important to look at Jonah and see how God used him, even though he wasn't willing in the beginning and he still had a bad attitude in the end. But last week, Jonah finally did what God wanted him to do. This morning, we're going to be looking at Jonah 4, verses 1 through 6, and next week, we'll conclude this series by looking at the remaining part of this chapter. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Jonah 4, and we'll look at verses 1 through 6. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come over Jonah, that it might shade him for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this scripture that we just read. God, I pray that as we uh, look into this text that we would be convicted, that we would be, uh, have open hearts to hear what you have to say. God, I pray that we would leave this morning as changed people, that we would go out and share the gospel that we have to share, the love that you have given each of us. God, I pray if there's someone here this morning that does not know you, that today, through this message, they would, they would see the love you have for your people and that they would come to you. God, I pray if there's someone here this morning that is, does know you but has gone away from you, has been like Jonah in chapter one fleeing from you, that they'll come back to you today. God, I pray that the words that I speak this morning would be your words and not my own. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a, a pastor, a minister, who was out uh, riding on his bike, and he was riding through the neighborhood, and he needed a lawnmower, and sure enough, as he went around the corner, there was a little boy standing there selling a lawnmower. And so he pulls over, and he asks the boy uh, how much he's selling it for, and he said, you know, I am selling it for money, but I'd prefer to have a bike. And so the pastor thought to himself, well, I need a lawnmower, you need a bike, maybe we can trade. So he asked the young boy if, if he'd be willing to do that. And the young boy thought, well, of course I'll do that. And the, the pastor said, or the boy said, but I want to try out your bike first. I want to make sure it works. So the pastor says, okay. And the boy gets on the bike, rides around the block, comes back, it's in working condition. So he gets off and the, the boy says, it's great, I'll make the trade. And then the, the pastor says, well, you tried out my bicycle. I want to try out your lawnmower. So he goes over and he, he pulls it. Nothing happens. He pulls and pulls and pulls. Nothing happens. And he looks at the little boy and says, you said this was in good working order, but it's not starting for me. And so the little boy says, you just got to keep pulling, keep pulling. And then if you cuss at it, it's going to start up for you. And so this pastor said, cuss at it. I'm a pastor, I'm a minister, I can't cuss at this. I, I haven't cussed since I came to Christ. I might have as a child or a young man, but when I came to Christ, that all changed. And this little boy looked at him and said, you keep pulling that handle and it's going to come back to you. <laughs> so we see that this is not meant to excuse sin. This is not uh, meant to uh, allow us to see that we can sin or should sin, but it's showing us that sin is easy to revert back to in our life. When we uh, get used to sin and then we turn away from it, when things don't go our way, it's very easy to turn back to those sins. Sometimes we turn back to a lifestyle that is not godly. And we're going to see that sadly here in chapter 4 of Jonah. In chapter 1, we had compared Jonah to being like the prodigal son who had run away from the will of the father, had run away from his, his family and did what he wanted to do, not what he should have done. And then uh, now if we were to compare Jonah to uh, chapter 4 of, of Jonah 4 to the same story of the prodigal son, we see that he's more like the elder brother. Now he is, he's selfish, he has a pity party, he's not willing to do what he should do. He's again not happy about his situation. If only the story of Jonah had finished 
in chapter 3. It would be a great story. If someone who uh, was fleeing from the Lord, came back to the Lord, did great work for the Lord, we're going to see in chapter 4, that's not the case. This was one man that had one message, had one amazing impact, yet we're going to see in chapter 4, he reverts back to his old ways. And we have to realize that it's not enough just to do what God wants us to do, but we have to do it with a willing and submissive heart. Jonah did go and do what God wanted him to do, but his heart was not fully submissive. He did not want the Ninevites to come to God. Ephesians 6, 5 through 6 says this, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Jonah was not doing this with a heart for God. We see in the beginning with verse 1 that Jonah does not have the right heart attitude here. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. What displeased him? Well, chapter 3, many people came to God, but those people that came to God through his preaching were his enemies. So he was displeased with this. Even though he had done something incredible, and something incredible is happening, so many people turning to God, he was unhappy with it. He was more concerned about his desires than he was about God's desires or even the lives of the Ninevites. This is honestly like a, a dream come true, chapter 3, for any preacher or evangelist or really any Christian to be able to share the gospel and have many people come to Christ. How many of us would uh, enjoy witnessing more often if more people came to Christ when we witnessed? Sometimes it's discouraging because we share the gospel and people don't uh, believe us or they don't want to listen to us. They are set in their ways. But here he's had a great response and yet he's pouting. That's why I've titled this message The Pouting Prophet. He was a preaching prophet last week and now he's a pouting prophet. He should have been overjoyed with the experience yet he let his selfish heart rob him from that joy. And we make things about ourselves, we rob ourselves of the joy that God will give us. So why did Jonah feel this way? Why was Jonah pouting here? Why was he not happy? Here are some possibilities. Maybe he was wanting God's blessing for Israel alone like we've talked about throughout this series. Maybe he just wanted God's blessing for himself and, and those of Israel. Maybe he wanted his nation's enemies to be destroyed. When he went into Nineveh and he proclaimed that 40 days you will be overthrown, that term overthrown is the same as uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he maybe just wanted them to be destroyed. Maybe his reputation was at stake. He's now uh, preaching to his enemies. He's not with his, uh, his own people. He was influential in God sparing his enemy. Imagine him going home at this point knowing that all these Ninevites are now being blessed by God, and you go back home to your people that hate them, they're not going to be happy with you. They would probably label you as a traitor. And we understand that this is a, we have to understand it's a privilege to be used by God. And he uh, let his own will, his own desires, cloud his judgment, and he wasn't understanding that it is a privilege to be used by God. Verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And Jonah here begins a prayer. He was angry because God decided not to bring destruction upon the Ninevites as he said he was going to do. He wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. They were his enemy. They were a fierce nation. They were wicked people. But remember, Israel in this time were, were not living uh, godly lives either. They were uh, doing wicked things too under the leadership of King Jeroboam II, as we talked about several weeks ago. And one commentary noted this. He said, Jonah was afraid to tell people of, of Nineveh because he knew that God was full of mercy and grace. This commentary said that maybe he didn't want to go originally to Nineveh, not because he was scared of his enemy, but he was scared that they would come to God, and he hated them so much he didn't want them to experience the love of God. 
Jonah loved God's grace and mercy when it benefited him himself and his people, but he detested it when it was extended to his enemy. Imagine just for a moment what it would have been like if God treated Jonah the same way Jonah wanted God to treat the Ninevites. Putting into perspective this morning, just think about that for a second. The hypocrisy and the, the perspective there. If God treated him the same way he wanted God to treat the Ninevites, the story would be drastically different. This is a very selfish attitude on display by a man who was supposed to be a prophet of God. This man who had just gone out and preached and almost had a, like a great revival experience. So many people coming to God and instead of ex being excited about that, instead of praising God in that, instead of uh, being overjoyed by the fact that people are now saved from eternity in hell and going to heaven, he's throwing a pity party and he's not happy with God. He was more concerned with his own desires than he was about the lost souls of his enemy, of those Ninevites. And this prayer was all about him. If you go back and look at it, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Was not uh, this that I said when I was still in my country, therefore I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you're a gracious and merciful God. How often are our prayers about us versus giving God glory? This prayer was all about him. He was selfish in this moment. He basically has an I told you so moment with God. Let me encourage you this morning. Do not have that encounter with God where you think you know better than he does. Do not have an I told you so moment with God as Jonah does here. And instead of praising, be God, uh, praising God because he was full of mercy and grace, he cries out to God in opposition to it. He doesn't want his enemy to experience any of this mercy or grace. And we now see that Jonah has reverted back to his past way of thinking, and he was serving God, but he did not have a, a true heart of surrender. And in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a sad prayer here. Jonah prayed a, a good prayer when he was in a bad place, and now he prays a bad prayer when he's in a good place. Remember his, his prayers before, his good prayers of calling out to God to save him when he thought he was dying, and now he is alive, great things are happening, and he's praying a bad prayer. God, take my life. I don't want to live. This is not how I want to live. Notice the difference in his prayer. He originally wants God to save him. Now he wants God to take his life. What a sad, sad situation. And Jonah would literally rather die than take joy in the great work that God was doing because it wasn't about him. Jonah was a, a selfish prophet and he was not taking joy in what God was doing. This is the same kind of scenario that happened on the boat when he, he played the martyr card, I said, and he wanted to be thrown overboard, uh, acting as if it was his fault for the storm which he knew, but throw me overboard because it's my fault. He wasn't really repentant in that moment. He had not had a, a changed heart. He just would rather die than do the will of God. That's how much he hated his enemy. Jonah would not have wanted to go back home after this trip. God, take my life because his enemies were saved. His friends back home would label him as a traitor. And Jonah had a, a good theology, but it was all in his head and not in his heart. And there's a difference. We can know what the Bible says. We can have all the answers to all the questions people may give us. But if we don't have a relationship with God, if we're not able to take that from our head knowledge and, and instill it in our heart and live that out, then it's not doing us any good. We have to have knowledge and application, not just the knowledge. Notice that Jonah demonstrates here that he refused the original call, not because he thought that he would be ineffective, not because he didn't think he was good enough, but because he knew that preaching the word of God would be effective. He didn't want to go because it says in his prayer that God is a God full of mercy and grace, and he did not want that for his enemy. Verse 4, then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Imagine God saying to us this morning, is it right for you to feel that way? And God confronts him. We see the Lord's response to Jonah's sad prayer. And instead of responding in fierce anger that either uh, any of us would probably do, God again demonstrates his mercy and grace by asking the question, 
Is it right for you to be angry? He wanted Jonah to pause and really think about the situation, really examine what was going on. This was meant to make Jonah do a heart examination, see what's in his heart, see why he should be taking joy in this great work instead of now being out of the city and pouting. The word angry here means to, to burn or to be kindled. This was a, a feeling from within. He was not just upset, but he was angry. And God's pointing out to Jonah that this anger is not justifiable. Sometimes anger is justifiable, but you can't be angry at people responding to God's word. People coming to God, and he's angry about this. But notice that when we make things about our preferences instead of God's desires, we rob ourselves of the joy and the blessing that God has for us. And that's exactly what Jonah is doing here. By God asking this question, we see that he was giving an examination of Jonah's heart, and we see that God asking questions is not rare throughout Scripture. I encourage you to go look at some of the questions that God asked throughout Scripture. Genesis 3, he said, Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? What is this that you have done? He was talking to Adam and Eve who had, had sinned, and they only knew they were naked because they had sinned. They wanted to be like God. So God asked him, Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? What is this that you have done? The next chapter, Genesis 4 where is your brother Abel? What have you done? When Cain had killed Abel, God knew the answer, but he wants them to be honest. He wants them to reflect on their actions. Second Samuel 12, God speaking through Nathan. Why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Remember the, the great sin with Bathsheba that led to many other sins, including uh, killing her husband in battle intentionally. Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? Who do the people say I am? But talking to his disciples, who do you say I am? Matthew 20, there's two blind men needing sight, and Jesus asked them, what do you want me to do for you? He wants them to really understand who he is. Luke 22, Jesus asked Judas, imagine being in this situation and seeing this. Are you betraying the Son of Man? with a kiss. And lastly, Acts 9, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And that was the, the time where Saul turns to God, and we see that he becomes Paul and does so many things, and so many scriptures are written by that man. God uses questions sometimes to make us stop and, and wonder and, and look at and evaluate our heart. In verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, there he made himself a shelter and sat under it for the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah, now distraught at the great work that God was doing, leaves the city and goes to pout. Instead of staying there and continuing to preach, instead of staying there and encourage them, instead of staying there and helping them grow in their faith, answer questions, he leaves and takes a front row seat to see what is going to happen. In his heart, he was still hoping that God was going to destroy the city of Nineveh. Jonah had successfully been a means of blessing to others, but now he's missing out on the blessing himself. He's made it all about himself. He's done what God wanted him to do, but he's not taking joy in it. He's not excited about it. He's pouting about it. Notice that the text here does not show an answer from Jonah back to God's question about his anger. Did Jonah leave the city because he was fearing for his safety? Because we know he was still hoping that God would destroy them. Was he, was he leaving because he thought, if God still does destroy them, I don't want to be here when it happens? Did he leave because he was just angry at God and he didn't want to stay there? He was tired of doing what God wanted him to do? Did Jonah not give a response because he was too stubborn or, or embarrassed to? We don't know, but some things to ponder. We know, though, that Jonah went out of the east, on the east side of the city. And this might have been because it's an elevated area, so he wanted a front row seat to see what God was going to do to the city. Maybe this is also an area where he had finished his ministry. 
And it says here that he, he built a shelter, and this shelter would be like the shelters that we read about in the Bible being in vineyards, basically a small booth, nothing fancy. It's basically like a, a little hut, and they were typically constructed of branches interlaced with each other, and when they did that, the leaves would help reflect some of the hot Assyrian sun away from them. So he makes this little hut, and he sits there and pouts. Now, as parents, we kind of think of our children when they don't get their way, and they just go and sit down and pout. And Jonah here, supposed to be a prophet of God, is now going out and acting like a, a little child. He, he's not getting his way. And after constructing this, he, he just sits there and waits. Instead of using this time to examine his heart, which is what God would have wanted, for him to see where he was wrong, he's still examining and judging the people of Nineveh. And without saying a word, his attitude shows his defiant heart. He was going to wait and see if the Ninevites had truly repented, or if they would quickly turn back to their evil ways, knowing and hoping that God would bring destruction upon that city. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might shade, be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. God again, showing grace and mercy, provides for Jonah by preparing a plant to shelter him. Little did Jonah know that God was going to use this as a teaching moment for Jonah. God prepared, notice that in your text, God prepared this plant. Just as he prepared that storm, just as God had uh, prepared the fish, he now prepares a plant with a purpose. This was for Jonah, to give him shade. And the phrase, deliver him from his misery, literally means to deliver him from his evil. He needed shade in this moment. If you do some research, the average temperature in this region is about uh, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine him being there, pouting. He wants this covering over his head. His little hut's probably not doing much. God provides this plant for him. And now we see Jonah's happy. Jonah was grateful for the plant. Depending on your translation, if you go back and do some digging. It means very grateful or exceedingly glad. It means that he rejoiced with a great joy that God had provided this plant for him. This is the first time we see Jonah happy in this entire story. Chapter 1, he's running from God. Chapter 2, uh, we see that he's still not doing all that God wants him to do. He, he does come back to God. Chapter 3, he uh, does what God wants him to do, but he's still not happy. God provides a plan for him to not be too hot, and now he's happy. He is happy and grateful because God was providing for him. Again, he was being selfish. He wanted God to bless him. He was happy because he was experiencing the blessing of God, and it didn't matter what was going on with the others. How selfish of Jonah to take all of the joy in, in God's blessing him while not taking joy in sharing God's blessing with his enemy. All while sitting around and waiting and hoping that Nineveh would turn back to their ways and that God would ultimately destroy them. How often do we do the same thing? Do we take joy in the, the good times when God's blessing us, but when our enemies or those we don't like tend to get that promotion or whatever it might be, we get angry. We, don't, we miss out on God's blessing in our life because we're so focused on what other people are doing. We, we miss the point. Jonah was exceedingly happy about a plant, but not about the lives of the Ninevites that had just come to God prior in chapter 3. This is not okay. We are not supposed to be thankful in the good times, but also in the bad and tough times. And honestly, a lot of the times of, of trials and, and testing and the, the hard times mold us and prepare us for the next time that we go through a hard time. But the encouraging thing is that God is always there for us. There's nothing greater than our God. God will provide for his people. Reverse the thought just for a moment. Imagine what life would be like if God only blessed us when we are blessing him. Imagine what life would be like if God only blessed us when we were doing what he wanted us to do with a willing and submissive heart. God is worthy of our praise in all circumstances. And we'll see next week with the ending of the story how it's, it's different from most books in the Bible. And it ends with a question again to Jonah. Psalm 103 shows us that we need to give praise to God 
in all of our circumstances. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his mercies to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. That sounds familiar to what we just read in Jonah. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And his place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. On those who fear him and his righteousness, to children's children, to such as keep his covenant. And to those who remember his commandments to do them, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. And his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his host, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. No matter what we are going through in life, God is there for us. We are supposed to be uh, praising his name. There was a young man who uh, took his girlfriend out to dinner. And he uh, took her to this dinner, and uh, she was excited about it. It was her birthday. And he gives a, a present. He puts this box on the table. And she's looking at that box. She wants to open it. He says, no, we're going to wait till after we finish the meal. He's kind of playing with her emotions right now. And he puts that there. And of course, the entire meal, she's looking at that box, thinking, what's in this box? What, what is it? He got me something. What did I say I wanted? What have I hinted at that I wanted? Guys, pick up on hints because girls expect you to remember. And uh, he's, uh, she's there fixated on this box. And as they're eating, she wants to open and keeps saying, no, wait till we finish. She finally takes the last bite and says, can I open the box? And he says, of course, you can open it now. And she opens it with great anticipation. She's all excited. It's uh, built up through the whole meal, and she sees this little pillow inside this box. And she's trying not to be rude, but she kind of looks at it like, what is this? What's this pillow? I didn't ask for a pillow, and so she tries to keep a smile on her face, and she pulls it out, thinks if she turns it over, there'll be something there. And she flips it over, and there's nothing there. And so she's looking at it, and she's thinking, well, thank you. Thanks for this pillow. She's trying to be appreciative, and thank you for giving this to me. I don't really understand it. And so she sets it on the table, and the the young man takes that pillow and puts it on the ground. Then he kneels on that pillow and pulls out a ring and asks her to marry him. And we see that she was so fixated on what was in it for her. What, What did he do for me? that she missed out on the conversation through the whole meal that he was trying to have with her. She was missing out on the things going on around her. She was kind of missing the point. He had done something nice for her, but she was not very satisfied with the pillow. But then he kneels down, and we see how the, the story ends. Sometimes things don't go the way we're expecting, but God will use us for willing to be used. We need to be like Jonah in chapter 3. Going out and doing the will of God, we need to do it with an open and willing heart. God can use you when you don't want to be used. Imagine what he can do in and through you if you're willing to be used for him. And that should be an encouragement to us this morning that God wants to use his people. God wants to use us. What does God have in store for you? Maybe you don't know. Have you asked God what he wants from you? Have you asked God how you can be used by him? We've talked the last several weeks about different uh, areas in the church that people can serve. 
Has God put something on your heart for you to serve in a certain ministry? Has God given you a talent that no one else knows about that you can use for his service? When we talked about Dorcas on Mother's Day, God had given her the, the, the craft to uh, make things, so she uh, knitted and made things for the widows. She used what God gave her to be a blessing. Are we doing the same? And do we take joy in God blessing others? Do we take joy when we see others come to Christ? Are we sharing Christ with others is what it all boils down to. Jonah had a good theology, but it was all in his head. And it was missing from his heart. Let me encourage you this morning to, as you read the Bible and you gain knowledge, use application in your life. Don't just read it and, and understand and be able to answer questions and feel smart. It doesn't help you if you're not applying it in your life. What does God want you to do this morning? As we close out the service, we're going to sing a great song of uh, 10,000 Reasons. And the song is, it starts with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And uh, when the first um, uh, verse comes up, you'll see that uh, the sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. God gives us uh, new mornings. And we see that uh, in the song, as you read through the lyrics, sometimes we just sing songs because of repetition. But if you really look at the lyrics, it's talking about no matter what you are going through, God provides. No matter what is happening in life, God is there for you. And we need to say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That is my prayer this morning. God, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the story of Jonah. God, I pray that we will leave here as changed people, that we will not just have knowledge of your word, but we will take that knowledge and, and let it go into our heart, bleed into our heart, God, and that we would be uh, disciple makers for you, that we would go out and share your gospel. God, I pray if there is someone here this morning that does not know you, that today they would come to know you, that they would accept you as their Lord and Savior. If there's someone here who has run away from you, I pray that today would be the day that they come back to you. God, I pray if there's someone here who has any burden on their heart, that they would share that with someone, that we can pray for one another, and that this week we would go out and take joy in all the blessings that you've given us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.